In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Ave Maria Purissima. So today the Church focuses uh, us on uh, the value of our prayer, that is the prayer of intercession. We speak of prayer as likewise just a lifting of the mind and heart to God. This means by which we commune with God, the uh, beloved of our soul. At the same time, we see our Lord expressly commands us to make intercession for others and for ourselves. And if we ask ourselves first, well, why does he ask us to make intercession if he, if he knows all things? Then why is he asking us to make known to him, right, what we need or what others need? And St. Thomas replies to that uh, beautifully by explaining how it's not so much for God's benefit, right, who does know all things, but rather that we recognize, right, that we have need of him. Again, the whole purpose of our life is to glorify God, right? We are his handiwork, we are his creatures. And so when we humbly acknowledge our dependence on him, we thus proclaim his glory as our infinite benefactor. And so we fulfill the very purpose of our life by making intercession. And likewise, we are to intercede for others as well. Now, it's, we do well to think about this for a moment because this really answers uh, this strange uh, Protestant objection where they say that, you know, we shouldn't approach the saints to ask them to pray for us. But rather, as I always quote, 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so that we should only have access, therefore, to Christ uh, to intercede for us before the Father. Now, it's a very good uh, practice, if you're ever in a debate with a Protestant, uh, to go back to the whole passage there of Scripture. Right? They know a few verses by memory, but they don't know the Scriptures, nor even those very, the context of those very passages. So if you direct them back, oftentimes if you have them read it from their Bible, you'll have a chance to think and collect your thoughts or look at your notes. Uh, but there we see in Second, uh, First Tim Timothy chapter 2, that St. Paul begins that whole paragraph by saying, I desire, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in high station, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all piety and chastity, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator of God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So you can see in that context that our Lord, rather than saying we should not make intercession for others, because Christ does it as the one mediator, rather tells us that we have to make intercession for others, right? And that their knowledge of the truth and salvation depends on us being mediators for them, mediators in the one mediator. And that's why we are presented with this gospel today on intercession in the context of Paschal Tide. What is the mystery? We'll contemplate it. It'll hit us uh, uh, starkly on, on Thursday when we extinguish the uh, Paschal candle after the gospel, right? Why is Christ leaving us? I thought he was the light of the world going to convert the whole world. Well, you remember the Paschal Vigil, when that Paschal candle came in representing Christ, we received of his light, right? Because now you are the light of the world. The salvation of the world depends on you cooperating with Christ. But now it's not... Christ is there and I'm here, but rather you are incorporated into Christ. And so recall the words of our Lord today in the Gospel where he says, I do not say that I will pray for you, for the Father himself loves you. Right? Now we're not separate from Christ. By our baptism we have been incorporated into Christ. That is the essence of the Christian life. That we are sons of God in the Son of God. Okay? That's one body, one mystical body to which we pertain. And so now when we pray, we pray in Christ, through him, with him, in him, to the Father. And he sees in us his beloved Son. And so as he revealed that in the baptism of, of our Lord, so he reveals it to us in our baptism by which we are incorporated into Christ and become beloved by him. So that's why we should make intercession for others. It's part of our participation in the life of Christ and the life of Christ which continues for all eternity. Right? and to the end of time at least, in terms of petition. For what is he doing in heaven? Right? Just sitting up there waiting? He said he would prepare a mansion for us. But St. Paul tells us he likewise lives forever to make intercession for us. He's our high priest, on, uh, enthroned in the Holy of Holies in heaven. And what we participate in here, in, in Mass, 
par excellence, but also in our individual prayer, is a participation in that same um, heavenly uh, intercession of Christ for all of us, for our salvation. So when we pray, we connect with him at the right hand of the Father and participate in this priestly role of saving others by our intercession. And St. Augustine goes on to explain that the, if we do this faithfully, uh, our Lord's words are true, obviously, right? But how are we to understand them when he tells us that anything you ask in my name will be given you? So wait a minute, I'm not sure if that always has worked. I'm not, I mean, I've prayed, I've asked in his name, but it doesn't seem that my uh, prayer was answered. So how do we understand that? Well, St. Augustine tells us, uh, first off, he explains whatever you ask in my name. His name, of course, is Jesus, Yeshua, which means the Lord who saves. And so anything that you ask, which is for your salvation, will be given you. If you ask for something which is not conducive to your salvation, right, even though you think it might be great to have a million dollars or whatever, or this or that car, maybe that would be a hindrance to your salvation as it's very difficult for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so St. Augustine says, if it's not conducive to your salvation, it's not in that category of anything, right, that you ask, but rather nothing, as it would serve no purpose for you. And so we have to ask for, and it's infallible, he says, when we ask what we need for our salvation, for ourselves, right, as God desires the salvation of all men, as we heard today, and so uh, if we are desiring it, we're in perfect accord with him. And note that it's anything we need for our salvation, not just the grace of a happy death, but all the graces we need to grow in holiness, to conquer vices, to grow in virtue. Ask for everything you need for your salvation. Our Lord is dying to give it to you. And that if we do so with humility and perseverance are the other two conditions he has, because patience has a perfect work, right? He who perseveres until the end, he shall be saved. So we have to persevere, as we just contemplated in the Feast of St. Monica. She had to wait 30 years for the conversion of her son, but it happened at the most opportune time when he was with St. Ambrose, which put him on the path to become a bishop and now known as a doctor of the church, right? And so, in God's time. And although it's only infallible praying for our own salvation, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much for the salvation of others, right? According to our degree of friendship with God and holiness and sacrifice, how we conform ourselves to Christ crucified, we will be instruments for the uh, conversion of others as well. But of course, there's that mystery of iniquity where they can, put, they can resist the grace of God. But the scripture tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, right? To turn it as he will, as we see even the Pharaoh and uh, the uh, Egyptians. And so, let us never cease to pray for others, right? We hear uh, in that quote from St. Timothy, uh, from St. Paul to St. Timothy, of how uh, the knowledge, others' knowledge of truth and salvation depends on our prayer, right? And all private revelations which have occurred in public and miraculous manners uh, to draw our attention, like Our Lady at Fatima. What was the message of Fatima? What was the message of Fatima? The key message was, pray the rosary every day. Pray for the conversion of sinners. There's so many that go to hell because they have no one to pray and make sacrifice for them. That's her maternal plea. And that is spiritual maternity, right? When we ask ourselves, what is the role of a mother in the church? We look to the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? And her role, she's the queen of the apostles. She's the mother of the church. She's the mother of divine grace. She does not go out in the apostolate with the apostles. She stays back, but she's praying. She's winning for them all the graces that they need. She's praying for the conversion of the people that they will preach to, as it's not by persuasive words, right? Or human wisdom, as St. Paul says, but it's by the grace of God. Okay, that's the role of spiritual maternity. And mothers, remember that too. What you can't seem to obtain by your constant insistence of your words, and it never affects that instantaneous change, and. Uh, others of your of your children or in your family, you can obtain by winning the grace, right? The very fact that your heart suffers for their faults, for their uh, imperfections, for their evils, that is, uh, you can offer that up, right? That is the altar of your heart, and you can obtain graces for them through that same struggle. Okay, it's a it's a it's an act of love. 
And we have many great examples, as I mentioned to you in that work on uh, spiritual maternity by the Congregation for the Clergy, which I linked to the uh, announcement today. To review that, it's just maybe 30 pages of just inspiring lives of saints, and one that I haven't mentioned to you before is that of Venerable Consolata Betrone. She was from Italy, and uh, she dedicated herself. It's, it tells us the sacrifices and prayers of a spiritual mother for priests benefit especially those who have gone astray or who have abandoned their vocations. Right? Recall the, the words of Scripture, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Right? That's the enemy's plan. Our counterattack right? should be to pray for our priests. Like we see the early church praying for St. Peter, for the Pope, right? when he was um, uh, chained. And so we should always be praying for our spiritual leaders as on them uh, does our uh, salvation depend. And so this was her mission that she was given from our Lord. And she, uh, Jesus said to her one day, your lifelong task is for your brothers, Consolata. You too shall be a good shepherdess and go in search of your brothers and bring them back to me, your brother priests. Consolata offered everything for her brother priests and others consecrated to God who were in spiritual need. And here's how she did it, okay? No uh, plan here, a secret plan that, not, that everyone couldn't imitate. She says, while working in the kitchen, she prayed continuously in her heart, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. Have you even heard that at the end of, some people add it to the end of their decades of the rosary. It comes from this inspiration, okay? Jesus, Mary, you can add St. Joseph, I love you, save souls. And she consciously made every little service and duty into a sacrifice, okay? All of her domestic tasks. She didn't go out and do something extraordinary, didn't work miracles. Just all of her little labors, she offered for that intention, trying to repeat constantly in her heart, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. And Christ said in this regard, these are all meaningless things, but because you bring them to me with such love, I confer immeasurable value to them and shower them on the discontented brothers as grace for conversion. Very grave and difficult cases were often entrusted to the prayers of the convent. Consolata would take upon herself the corresponding suffering that each entailed. And for weeks or months on end, she sometimes endured dryness of spirit, abandonment, meaninglessness, inner darkness, loneliness, doubt, and even the sorrow of the sinful state of the priests she was praying for. She once wrote to her spiritual director during these struggles, how much the brothers cost me. Yet Jesus made her a magnificent promise, Consolata, it is not only one brother that you will lead back to God, but all of them. I promise you, you will give me the brothers one after another. And so it was. She won all the priests entrusted to her back to a fulfilling holy priesthood. And there are recorded testimonies of many of these cases. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name shall be given you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Venerable Consolata, pray for us.